I want to give many thanks to the Library's Nautical Advisory Council for their generous support of today's program. And I'll give you a little background about our presenter. Will Van Dorp is an independent writer and photographer based in Queens, New York. Uh, he has a blog called Tugster. I'll put that information into the chat shortly. Uh, with posts almost daily since 2006, mostly about the ships and boats in New York Harbor, which he has dubbed the sixth borough, or if you will, the original borough. His recent writing of for print has appeared in Professional Mariner, Ocean Navigator, Pacific Maritime, and the periodical Bottoming Out, published by the Canal Society of New York State. He has made numerous trips as onboard lecturer aboard vessels of Blount Small Ship Adventures, traveling between Narragansett Bay and such Great Lakes, St. Lawrence River cities as Chicago, Cleveland, Toronto, and Quebec City via the Hudson River and Erie Canal. He was writer and director for the 2014 documentary Braves of Arthur Kill, telling some of the stories of the vessels rusting into oblivion on the Arthur Kill waterway. He's a retired English professor who taught in a variety of settings in five countries for over 40 years. And we are very glad to welcome back Will Van Dorp for today's program, A Field Guide to Ships in New York Harbor. So take it away, Will. Thanks a lot, Jeff, and um, welcome everyone. Thanks for stopping by. I'll get right started. Um, I call this Field Guide to Ships asterisk in New York Harbor because I really don't wanna get into a, a discussion of what's a ship and what's a boat. So I'm gonna duck the question and call them all vessels. Uh, or maybe ship, maybe boat, but I'm not going to commit myself to ships. One of the tools I use uh, when I go out uh, seeing what's in the harbor is an app called Marine Traffic. There are other tools, you probably can get them on your smartphone. Uh, there's one called Vessel Finder. And if you look closely at the map of Long Island and uh, New York and New Jersey there, you'll see that there are icons of different colors. Um, if the icon is pointy, uh, it's moving. If it's a diamond, it's stationary. And, it's, and, and the, the icons are color coded. So uh, red is for tankers, green is for ships, Aqua is for tugboats, blue is for passenger vessels, and magenta, pink, is for uh, personal vessels. I'm not going to talk about personal vessels today. That, that, that would be a whole different topic. Um, probably, like me, you have, uh, definitely in the library, but also on your own personal bookshelves, uh, some field guides. I have a field guide to birds, field guide to uh, fish, field guide to trees, and so on. And I'm using the field guide approach, um, borrowed from my field guide to birds book. And we're going to be looking at what you might see if you were to go out to the harbor. If we were to, uh, if we had done this 150 years ago, most of the ships in the harbor would be like this one, uh, sailing vessels. Um, when a sailing vessel would come into the port, it would take, uh, 20, 50, who knows how many longshoremen to discharge the cargo and reload cargo to take it to the next, next destination. Occasionally, today, there are still sailing cargo vessels like this one. Grain to Sail uh, is a modern cargo vessel. It's small. It's 72 feet by 20 feet but it's a prototype. There, there's a group in France who uh, is currently operating under the Grain de Sale uh, name. They're doing triangular trade between France, New York, and the Caribbean. Uh, Grain de Sale was in New York earlier this month. Right now, it's not steaming, but sailing toward Dominican Republic with a cargo of about uh, 20 tons of medical supplies. Medical supplies will be offloaded in the, in the Dominican Republic, and then uh, Dominican um, cocoa or, or cacao and coffee will be loaded into the hold and taken to France. In France, the cocoa and coffee will be um, 
worked into, you know, candy bars and coffee. And later this year, grain to sale will come back to New York Harbor with a hold full of French wine. This sailing ship was in New York Harbor also earlier this month. Uh, it was built in 1914. Uh, it's state of the art science and uh, training ship now. So it has engines, it has all the electronics that you would expect to find in a, mar uh, a modern cargo ship. But mostly in the harbor, there are no sailing cargo vessels. Now for today's presentation, I hope to leave you with, with a bunch of new terms, concepts, words. Container ship, I'm guessing everyone knows. Uh, ULCV is a, an acronym. There are so many in, in so many uh, industries um, for ultra large container vessel. Ultra large container vessel is distinguished from a Panamax container vessel in that it would not fit through the Panama, the original Panama Canal anymore. TEU is the unit that's, that's, uh, uh, that quantifies the amount of cargo on a container ship. So a 20 foot equivalent would be the 20 foot container that you might see on a truck on the highway. There are 20 foot containers and 40 foot containers. And I'll talk about TEUs in a little bit. Row row stands for roll on, roll off. So a row row is a vessel that transports, that moves cargo that can be driven onto the ship and then at the next port driven off the ship. Conro is a hybrid between a row row and a container vessel. A bulk carrier carries bulk materials like sand, salt, scrap, metal, and so on. And a tanker uh, transports bulk liquid material. So let's look at some photos of these different types of uh, vessels that come into the Port of New York every day. What you're looking at here is one outgoing ship and another incoming ship. Between the two, they're probably carrying about 30,000 of those boxes that I referred to earlier as TEUs. This happens every day. This is an example of a Panamax container vessel. This one, and I forgot to look it up, but I would guess it probably is carrying about 7,000 of those boxes, 7,000 TEU. In contrast, you might remember a couple of years ago, there was a lot of attention paid to the CMA CGMT Roosevelt. It was the first of the ULCVs that came into, into the port. Uh, T. Roosevelt has the capacity of 14,000. So think about that next time you're on the highway. One of these uh, ULCVs can carry 14,000 of those boxes. However, ship size is increasing. Magellan, CMA, CGM Magellan came in, into port a few years ago. It has a capacity of 15,000. TEU. And I took this photo earlier this month. CMA CGM Jules Verne is so far the largest type of, of container ship that has come into New York. It has the capacity of 16,000. So Panamax, 7,000, up to this size, 16,000. And if you look at the size of the tugboat there, relative to the, the, the container ship, um, it's massive. Not all container ships need to be this large. For example, BCL, BCL stands for Bermuda Container Line. This ship is called the Oleander, makes the run between Bermuda and the Port of New York every week. Each Thursday, you can count on Oleander coming into the port. Oleander can carry, if I remember the number right, um, 400 containers. You see that on the uh, forward deck. Um, 
and in the hold. You, you can't see the ones that are in the hold. But it, if you look at the stern of the vessel, it's enclosed. It also carries um, cars, trucks, construction equipment, and so on. So Bermuda doesn't need to have a 16,000 TEU ship calling there. This is a made to uh, size vessel that commutes between Bermuda and New York each week, uh, each week, yes. A variation on that is what's called a uh, Conroe. So it has container vessels and it has rolling um, cargo. In other words, vehicles, cars, trucks, and construction equipment. So this particular Conro can carry up to 2,000 um, containers and 800 vehicles. You can imagine, and, and, and if, if you uh, paid attention to the news yesterday and this morning, there was a container ship coming from Europe to New York um, through the North Atlantic, and it ran into some serious weather, and some of the containers fell over the side. This has been happening with some frequency in recent years. Uh, if you look at the way the containers are stacked on the foredeck, you'll see why this might happen. One company, Atlantic Container Line, ACL, um, serves exclusively the North Atlantic and they have designed their vessels so that there is much more support for the containers to prevent them from being washed overboard in a storm. Uh, ACL claims that they have never lost a container over the side in all their years of operation. And you can see with the substantial supports why that would be the case. This vessel might puzzle you when you first see it because it's like a hermet, uh, somebody described it once to me as a hermetically sealed thermos bottle. Well, inside that ship, which is called a row row, a roll on roll off, uh, there can be up to 7,000 vehicles. The vehicles are moved in and out of the hold by way of the ramp that you see on Asian King. Um, it's a huge ramp controlled by cables. And here you see the ramp down. It's almost like uh, a drawbridge for, for a castle. Here it's down, here it's up. Uh, controlled by cables, uh, longshoremen run onto the ship in large numbers, jump into a vehicle that uh, has been uh, released for movement, drive it off, park it in the parking lot. This would be in Bayonne, New Jersey, uh, then run back in and uh, grab the next vehicle. So, so far we've seen container ships, uh, row rows, con rows. This is a row row. This is an entirely different looking ship. Um, there are no containers on the deck. If you look closely above the letter Rhine, you see there are some look like flat plates there. Those are the hatch covers. There might be seven to eight huge hatch covers. Um, and in the hold of Rhine, you might have bulk, like 60,000 tons of bulk salt, road salt coming from somewhere overseas. Uh, it might contain uh, sand or aggregates. Um, difference between Rhine and Thor Courage, Rhine had no deck cranes, so it would be reliant entirely on uh, cranes that are at a port. Thor Courage is, is a bulk carrier also. It, it, it's probably um, carrying or coming into the port to load scrap metal. Um, it can load scrap metal with its own cranes. The, the cranes right now are stowed for transit, but when they come into the port, the cranes are unfolded, started up, 
and there are clamshells that the ship carries around with it from port to port. Uh, in this case, it's carrying sand, road salt, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, salt, road salt to, to New York. And um, it's discharging some of the road salt into the barge that you see uh, to the right of the, of the ship. The, the tugboat, and I'll talk about tugboats in a little bit. Uh, the tugboat is there to uh, keep the barge uh, in place or just waiting for the barge to be loaded and then it'll move the barge to wherever the salt is going to be discharged. Not the best photo, but you can see here, there is a barge on the right side of the ship and on the left side of the ship. It has uh, five cranes or four cranes, it looks like, and it can discharge salt both off the left side and off the right side simultaneously. Each of the cranes, of course, would be operated by uh, a crewman. In this photo, you see two tankers. Uh, big difference between a tanker and the other ships that I've shown you is that on the deck, you see miles of piping. This is what the piping looks like if you're, uh, in my case, I was on a bridge looking down at it or a drone photo of, of a tanker's deck would look like this. Each of those pipes, of course, is connected to a different hold. Um, there's ventilation pipes and so on. Tankers have a crane because the discharge hoses or the loading hoses uh, are heavy and need to be moved into position using that crane. Quite often, uh, if you're in the lower portion of the upper bay uh, near the Verrazano Bridge, you can see tankers waiting there. Uh, sometimes when they come into the port of New York, They are so deeply loaded, their draft uh, exceeds the possibility of continuing into the port. So a large tugboat with a large tank barge will come alongside and lighter, in other words, take some of the cargo off before the, the, uh, before the tanker is able to move farther into the port or up the river. I hope you can read the name of this tanker. It's called Orange Star. It's my favorite type of tanker coming into the harbor. It is a tanker, uh, but the cargo, the contents of, of the hold uh, are kept super cold because it's full of orange juice. Uh, there's a fleet of ships that come out of Brazil and they transport Brazilian orange juice uh, to the port of New York and to other ports around the world using tankers such as these. Uh, the next time you're in the supermarket and you buy, <clears throat> excuse me, orange juice, turn, turn it around and read where the, where the juice comes from. Uh, in a lot of cases, it'll be coming from a combination of uh, United States and Brazil and maybe other countries. Okay, let's move on uh, this page through our field guide. We're done with um, one type of vessel in the harbor. Let's talk about tugboats. And the, so some of these words you may know, some of these words uh, might be unfamiliar. A barge is a ship, if you will, that has no propulsion engines. It may have engines uh, that are used for pumps, but they don't use these engines for propulsion. The tug obviously is a small ship, small boat, it's called a tugboat, with huge engines. It's basically floating engine room. Uh, and it may have as many as five engines uh, in the engine compartment. ATB uh, is an acronym for articulated tug and barge. And I'll show you some examples of that in a, in, in a moment when we talk about the way a tug moves a barge. Now you might think that a barge is a rectangular vessel. It's not always a rectangular vessel. Often on the stern side of the barge, 
there's a notch, a notch is a notch. And I'll show you some photos of that. Uh, a tug may move a barge using cable, which is often referred to as wire or hawser, which is a non-metallic connection or push gear. And I'll show you some examples of that. So let's move on to tugboats. This is probably the way you imagine the tugboat. Tugboat is out front. Uh, there are two barges strung along behind it. In this case, there's a very short um, connection, uh, uh, very short lines between the, the tugboat and the barges. Tugboats, they come in all sizes. This one is 25 feet long. Uh, it has an engine uh, generating, it, it actually may have two engines, I'm not sure, but, but its total horsepower is 660 horsepower. Uh, the reason for a small tugboat like this, besides its ability to operate in shallow water uh, and in confined areas, is that there's a Coast Guard rule which says if your tugboat is less than 26 feet, and it's, there are inches involved there, but less than 26 feet, um, it can be operated by someone who does not need a captain's license. So, you know, construction company might have a tugboat of this size uh, and anybody who's able to drive the boat safely, license or no license is able to operate it. On the other extreme, this tugboat came into New York Harbor last summer, 150 feet long, 10,000 and change horsepower. Um, it has very different capabilities and di very different purposes. It's like in your toolbox, you have many different kinds of tools. This is the newest tugboat, so far as I know, in uh, New York City. <clears throat> it's, uh, I believe, 72 feet long, but maybe 25 wide. But it has an interesting feature. So take a look at this photo. You see where the words J. Arnold Witte are located. The wheelhouse is just beyond that. Now look at the wheelhouse in the next photo. The wheelhouse has been extended upward. So operating in New York Harbor, there are low bridges, uh, shallow water, tight places. And by having a um, adjustable height wheelhouse, um, you can squeeze underneath bridges, for example, if you need to. But then when you're alongside a barge that has some height, you're able to see over it and therefore operate safely. Barges. This is an unusual barge that you may have seen in Port Washington because it, uh, it's regularly operated or, or moved between the, uh, the Norfolk area and Narragansett Bay. Under that looks like a Quonset hut is a portion of a submarine. So submarine portions are uh, manufactured in Virginia and then they're moved to, I said, um, Narragansett Bay, it could be there, or they could be moved to New London to be assembled at the electric boat. So you might see a barge like that. Uh, and that barge was being towed by uh, or being towed on the wire. This tugboat is behind the barge in a notch, and you see that it's, a t it's attached uh, by, by means of these lines that run from the stern of the tugboat outward to the stern of the barge. So this is referred to as push gear. The tugboat is pushing the lines are the gear that keeps the barge securely fastened to the tugboat. Here you see another example of a barge um, being moved by a tugboat using push gear. In both cases, this one and the previous, um, the barge is a tank barge and it's being moved into the anchorage or into the port to supply fuel to the ships while they're discharging cargo. It's like the gas station comes to the port, but this is push gear. 
you don't see any push gear on Mount St. Elias. It's a secure, it's snug into the stern of the barge, but you, you, you might be wondering, so what keeps it in place? I'll show you another example. This one as shot from a bridge. You notice the tugboat toward the top of the photo is wedged pretty securely, looks like maybe a good 10, 15 feet into the stern of the barge. There's a um, designed notch there so that the tugboat will fit snugly into the stern of the barge. And here you see a notch. And if you follow the, uh, between the Lemon Creeks, you'll follow the lip there. Uh, it seems to, the lip seems to have the same shape as the front of a tugboat. Here's a tugboat out of the notch. And you notice uh, if you draw a line between, downward between the R on the stack and the name Christian Reinauer, you'll see what looks like a button on the side of the tugboat. That is called a pin. The pin may be as large as a diameter of two feet. Uh, there are huge hydraulic pumps inside the tug. And when the tug is securely in the notch, the hydraulic rams will push the pins into receptacles that are inside the notch of the barge. Here's a closer up of the pin. And here's another pin on another ship. The gradations to the left there in 1918, 17, those are feet. So that gives you some sense of uh, how large these pins are. <clears throat> it's a very secure way of moving uh, a barge, even in rough seas, the tug and the barge can pitch independently, but they roll together. Okay, let's talk about some barges we already have, but I'm gonna add some more uh, words and examples to it. So we have tank barge. Tank barge might, con might contain a petroleum product. A uh, deck barge, a deck barge would be kind of like a flatbed trailer. Crane barge, it's a barge with a crane. And a scow is sort of like a dump truck. So let's have a look at a, let's start with a tank barge. Sometimes in the anchorage, if not in the port, um, a ship will refuel using fuel that's pumped from the tank barge. Now there are of course engines on the tank barge, the engines run the pumps. And if you look closely between the barge and the ship, you can see what looks like a hose that's uh, stringing up there. The process of refueling a ship is sometimes called bunkering. So this is a tank barge, but some people might refer to it as a bunkering barge. Bunkers being fuel. Obviously a deck barge, in this case, it looks like some uh, NYPD car uh, automobiles uh, are being moved from Governor's Island back to Manhattan via this deck barge. A deck barge can, can take on any sort of um, cargo, whether it's uh, NYPD or airplanes. This, this uh, airplane was moved from somewhere in Connecticut to the Intrepid uh, this past fall and Obviously, I wanted to get a picture of it. An innovation in New York City, innovation for New York City, uh, using deck barges recent years has been to move garbage um, from the, gar the, the, uh, the garbage collection points around the city in containers uh, to a railhead in uh, Staten Island, and there's another one in uh, Port Elizabeth. Um, and those, 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 those containers provide a way of uh, moving garbage so that doesn't smell bad, stuff doesn't move around. 
Uh, once on, on, on the rail cars, they can be moved to New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, any, any location that's willing to um, accept money from New York City for receiving New York City garbage. Sometimes a container arrives in one port, for example, in Port Elizabeth, but it really needs to be loaded onto a ship uh, that loads in Brooklyn, at, at the container port in Brooklyn. So these are moved, uh, I didn't count the number of barges, uh, uh, containers on this barge, on this deck barge, but let's say there, there are 100 containers. I can't do the math quickly and talk at the same time. But rather than each of those containers being moved on a chassis to the other port on the highways, uh, it's moved via water, makes everybody happy. Uh, if you look at the ends on some of the uh, light colored containers on that barge, they have uh, refrigerator units on them. So they would be moving probably fruits and vegetables, things that need to be kept cold. Sometimes really odd things get moved around the harbor on a deck barge. These are tidal turbines that uh, were placed in the water last summer, I think it was, um, as an ongoing experiment for supplying electricity to Governor's Island. Uh, they were assembled someplace down by Perth Amboy. And I just happened to be lucky enough to catch a photo of these tidal turbines as they were being moved from P Perth Amboy to installation point east of Governor, uh, I'm sorry, Roosevelt Island, if I said Governor's Island, sorry, Roosevelt Island. Crane barges, exactly as um, I was describing. So sometimes repairs need to be done along bulkheads, sometimes heavy cargoes, many, many dozens or hundreds of tons need to be moved onto ships or out of ships. A crane barge comes alongside and provides a service. This is not a crane, this is, this is an ex excavator. And there is a dredging um, barge so this is a dredging barge. The dredge would uh, swivel around and could reach down to uh, dozens of feet to the bottom to uh, keep the channels free and clear. So there are many different uh, deck barges, crane barges, and you can guess what this is. So this is a barge that has no cover. A lot of people refer to these as scows, and I think of them as dump trucks. And you can see uh, by the contents of this scow that there's a lot of metallic scrap. Um, and if you look along the creek, I, I believe this was on the Bronx River, there are other scows waiting to receive uh, scrap to be moved onto um, one of those large bulk carriers that I was showing you earlier. Then the bulk carrier would take the scrap to places where it's melted down for uh, uh, to be recycled. Those places might be in Turkey, a lot of them. While we were pushing this scrap barge, you see we're headed for, I believe that's the Manhattan Bridge. Um, this is what the inside of the tugboat looks like. This was a single, uh, a single engine, single screw tugboat, an old tugboat perfect for moving scrap around the harbor. Notice the captain has Coca-Cola there and some cashews to keep himself um, happy while he's navigating the river safely. Here's another example of a scrap barge. In this case, it's uh, recycled paper. There's a paper recycling facility down in the Arthur Kill on the uh, west side of Staten Island. These are compacted uh, p uh, bricks of metal. I don't know if there are any cars in there, I can't tell, but uh, scows are used to move a lot of scrap materials, uh, recyclables and so on. Scrap can also, you know, I said dump truck. So here it's moving aggregates, uh, crushed stone, crushed stone to be moved to uh, either a road project or a building project. Sand, you can't have concrete without sand. 
So this barge was moving, single barge was moving uh, 8,000 tons of sand from Southern New Jersey uh, up to a ready mix facility in Brooklyn. This barge is covered. Uh, it moves sugar between a refinery that only partially refines the, the, the cane sugar, uh, located in Palm Beach, Florida, up to Yonkers, where there's another refinery that completes the process. The structure on the barge is a hatch remover. Hatches, you can imagine, weigh several tons. There's no way that deckhands or crew can um, remove those for discharging the, the raw sugar. So there's this um, structure that moves on rails up and down the deck of the barge uh, to remove the hatches. There's a cross harbor rail system. And besides looking at the rail cars on the barge here, I want you to look at the tugboat. So the tugboat here has a fairly high uh, wheelhouse so that it's able to see over the rail cars and you know travel safely. Here is the same tugboat. So here's another example of a tugboat, the Marjorie B. McAllister, that has uh, a variable height wheelhouse, down, up. Uh, in this case, the tugboat is attached to the barge with the rail cars alongside. There are a lot of government boats and RIBS, uh, RIB is an acronym for rigid inflatable boat. They're fast, they can go uh, 40 miles an hour. Uh, if there's a safety issue or an emergency of some sort, uh, in this case, it's a RIB operated by the New Jersey State Police, can move very quickly across the harbor. I've never seen this uh, FBI, it's not a RIB, but this FBI skiff, except the one time, uh, I took this picture and then I took the next picture and the next picture I have the, the person at the wheel looking at me, maybe with some suspicion, but um, government boat. NYPD has a lot of boats in the harbor. Uh, here's uh, a rib operated by the NYPD. Of course, New York City has uh, a lot of fire boats. Some of them are large and super powerful like this one. And because New York City has creeks with industry and uh, residential areas along them, they also need low slung um, fire boats like the William M. Fian. Um, even the mast, which is above the, what we call the roof of the, of the fire boat, um, can fold down in order to squeeze under ridges in, in the case that they need to get somewhere with uh, really low clearance. So this is part of the New York City Navy, some people refer to. Of course, the New York City Navy includes uh, a lot of Staten Island ferries. This is the newly retired um, JFK. It's for sale right now. You could buy it. Uh, I think there are about nine or eight or seven days left in the auction. You can find information about this online. It's been in service, I believe, since 65. So that's a lot of years of service that the uh, JFK provided for New York City residents. The newest, uh, actually the second newest, but the newest type of Staten Island Ferry replacing the JFK class is the Aulis, the uh, Staff Sergeant Michael H. Aulis. Uh, and it arrived in New York, I believe last summer. There will be three of these. Uh, the second one, Sandy Ground arrived, uh, I believe it was, uh, uh, last day, it was either New Year's Day or New Year's Eve. So uh, not yet in service, but uh, uh, taking part in training for the new crews. New York City has a sanitation 
actually, I shouldn't say sanitation, de de uh, Department of Enti Environmental Protection Navy. They have three of these tankers that move sludge from some uh, uh, waste treatment facilities to others. N not all of New York City, I, I think New York City has 14 waste treatment facilities. Of the 14, I believe eight can completely treat waste. The other six do so incompletely. So the sludge, which is incompletely treated waste is moved by one of these tankers. It is a tanker uh, from that facility to a, a DEP facility that can complete the process and turn it into, they say, drinkable water. I was offered some, I declined. Uh, near Port Washington at Fort Schuyler, uh, on the north side of the Throgs Neck Bridge, you may have seen this vessel. This is the uh, Empire State, the sixth or the fourth, I forget. Um, old cargo ship that's been, been converted into a training vessel. It belongs to um, the state of New York and I believe the, the federal government. Kings Point is even closer. Uh, this is the current Kings Pointer. Um, this vessel is used for training uh, new merchant mariners who are lucky enough to be at the Federal Academy in Kings Point. Corps of Engineers has a fairly large presence in, in New York City. This is a survey boat, and I'll show you a survey boat in, in a little bit, another one. Um, survey boat uses instrumentation to create images, maps of the bottom. Uh, is there enough depth in channels so that ships, barges, and so on can safely pass through? On uh, to the left here is one of my favorite um, Corps of Engineers vessels in New York Harbor. It's called Driftmaster, and it has a derrick up at the top uh, and a large boom projecting toward me when I was taking this photo. Uh, this travels around the harbor every day looking for logs, beams, and other debris that needs to be fished out of the harbor so that it doesn't uh, damage anyone's boat or cause harm. So if you see a, uh, for example, a broken off piling there's a uh, help number. You can call the Corps of Engineers, give the location of that piling, that floating piling, and they will send out Driftmaster and retrieve it. I'll talk about the vessel to the right in a little bit. Coast Guard is here, of course. Um, this is one of their 29-foot boats, super fast, maybe 45 miles an hour if need be. Uh, rapid response small patrol boat. You see the person in front uh, is very businesslike. There are 87 foot uh, Coast Guard vessels that come through the harbor. Uh, this I think is 170 foot. Uh, it's called Catherine Walker. Its job is to maintain uh, over 300 buoys in the greater New York area. So the crane on the foredeck there is used to lift buoys out of the water in case, for example, they need either maintenance or whether they need to be moved back on station. Fishing boats, believe it or not, uh, New York Harbor is a fishery. In um, the winter, I th think of it, usually from early December until March, uh, there are these small clamming draggers that come into the harbor. They're dragging up clams. They all come out of, well, they mostly come out of Belford, New Jersey. Um, and I would never have believed that, that, that fishing happens in New York Harbor. Okay, a bunch of new words. Pilot boat, bunkering tanker. I mentioned bunkering earlier. Crew boat, chand chandler, chandlering boat, or supply boat, line boat, boom boat and survey boats. So let's take a look at some of these. At a point, um, I'm told 16 miles outside the Verrazano, if you stay in the channel, there is either pilot boat number two 
or pilot boat number one. And this is the current pilot boat number one, but it, I believe, is about to be replaced. Pilots uh, live for short periods of time on the pilot boat, uh, waiting their turn in the rotation to venture down that ladder onto a smaller boat and go over to an incoming ship to guide the ship in. Um, let's say a ship is coming from China, the, the master might be incredibly um, uh, competent, but if he's never been to New York before, he really needs a pilot. And uh, actually everyone needs a pilot to avoid damage uh, to the port. This is a bunkering tanker, small tanker. I, I didn't look it up, but I believe it's about uh, 70 feet long. And think about all the ferries that are in New York Harbor, like the Circle Line ferries and the New York waterways uh, and so on. The fuel comes to them using this small tanker. And uh, the, 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 the crew of this boat start about three o'clock in the morning and they go from Circle Line boat to New York Waterways boat and so on to top off the fuel tank so that they're, they will have enough fuel for the day. So this is a bunkering tanker. They're crew boats. Crew need to be moved from dock to a ship in the anchor. Inspectors need to get onto ships in, in the anchorage. They would be moved via a crew boat. Those look like packages that you might find in front of the supermarket, definitely in front of the supermarket by me. Um, they are on this very old, but very capable, very robust little supply ship called Twin Tube, which started in the oystering business, but that's uh, irrelevant. These packages would be brought to a ship in the port or in the anchorage. Uh, they, may, they may be groceries, they may be uh, other supplies, tools, they may be spare parts, and so on. Chandler. If you are in a recreational boat and you're approaching the dock, you can easily throw the lines to the dock. You know, so you, sometimes you even land them on the cleat. Well, the lines securing a ship in the port are way too heavy to be thrown. And so there's a service. Um, this is Ken's Marine Service small boat. Uh, the dock line is lowered onto the boat and the boat drives the line to the bollard to be secured. Because of the increased size of container ships coming into the port and because of all the other changes in the port, there's a lot of surveying going on. This is one of those ocean going survey vessels, it can uh, go all the way out to where the pilot boats uh, and then well beyond. I mean, this, this, this particular uh, um, survey boat, Shearwater, um, operates up and down the East Coast. This is a smaller survey boat, uh, probably 30 feet long or less. And the the instruments are attached to the tube that's being checked by the crewmen there. Um, once they're finished checking whatever they're checking there, they swivel it forwards so that the business end is back in the water. And from the instruments on the tip of that uh, tube, uh, they can get a very accurate rendering of the bottom of uh, whatever the waterway is. In the United States, uh, after the Exxon Valdez uh, um, spill, there was, a, uh, th there was a pool of money that was put together. And I believe initially there were 15 of these marine spill response vessels. Uh, this one is, th th they're all called responder. Um, this one is the New Jersey responder. It's kept ready to go, uh, ready in the case that that spill that you really don't want to happen happens. Uh, it, it, it lives in the Arthur Kill 
and periodically they do a, a, a training run so that they're ready at a moment's notice. There are small boats on the deck, on the after deck of this uh, New Jersey responder, and they would assist in the cleanup. Small operators. Um, these are businesses in, in, in the port. CTO is one that probably most of you are familiar with. There are other, Towboat US is another. Uh, and some of these um, businesses have bought up old Coast Guard ribs and um, turned them into really fast uh, response vessels. If you're out of gas and um, with your recreational boat and you want to get help, one of these will get to you very quickly. Excursion boats. Everybody knows uh, Circle Line, Statue Cruises. Um, these operate all year round. I, I one time had out of town visitors and we got on the Statue Cruises boat, even though it was 17 degrees. And my out of town visitors were very happy to take an excursion over to the Statue of Liberty on a boat like this. Now this is another one of those ribs. It's been repurposed by a company in New York called the New York Media Boat. And besides taking media out for photos, uh, they also take people out for excursions for all kinds of purposes. So even though this looks like a Coast Guard vessel, uh, painted on the roof, you can't see it, and on decals all around it, which, which are hidden by the spray, uh, is a very fast excursion boat operated by New York media boat. I've mentioned wind farms a couple of times. Um, and because of all of the developments in wind farm development offshore out of New York, uh, there are vessels that I never imagined I would ever see in New York. And you notice this one has a derrick structure about midships. That derrick is over uh, an open area in the hull sometimes referred to as a moon pool, moon like the moon, and pool as in swimming pool. And it can lower um, instruments, uh, course, course sampling uh, tools, um, whatever they need to, to understand where the wind farms, uh, where the different pylons need to be uh, located and then return the, let's say, core samples back to whoever needs to look at them. Here's another example. This one doesn't have a derrick and a moon pool, but it has a large A-frame. Um, the, from the back of that A-frame, they can lower a mini submarine over the side or whatever they need in terms of instrumentation. And a lot of this is for purposes of the wind farm development. Here's the vessel that I showed earlier. Um, this, this, um, this survey boat goes all over the world, um, wherever, whether it's uh, for the wind farm development or the oil and gas industry, surveys of the bottom are necessary and are performed by vessels such as this. Now I've talked about um, commercial vessels. And so the last photo I'm going to show you, last one, and then we can take some questions. The last photo I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm going to show you, uh, is a person who who I would fit under the category of uh, commercial because person in the middle with his hands raised, he goes on adventures and then he writes books about it. So the gentleman is named Neil Moore. Uh, I took this picture in uh, December at the end for him of a 22 month trip. He began his trip in that canoe in February, 2020 in Astoria, Oregon and followed 22 rivers. So the name of his project is 22 rivers. That's gonna be the name of his next book. He's already written one uh, based on a canoe trip that he did from the headwaters of the Mississippi down to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, one happy guy, 7,500 miles under the keel of his canoe. And now he's writing the book about this trip. So I guess this qualifies as a commercial vessel. 
Questions? Well, first of all, thank you so much, Will. I, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, your presentation today. Um, I have to say it kind of make me, made me feel a little bit like a, a kid again, uh, reading the um, you know, Richard Scary books of what do people do all day and all the different types of cars and trucks and ships in the world. And, um, so uh, I, um, I do want to get to some questions, but again, uh, uh, I, I do want to start with one though. It, you obviously have a lot of terrific photographs here um, that you've taken. Could you just talk a little bit about, um, you know, how do you take these photos? What equipment do you use? You mentioned drone photos. Um, how do you get so close, you know, to be able to, uh, to get such great photos? Um, and there are a lot of different answers to it. Drone photography is in, in New York City is sort of complicated. So I, I have a drone, but I haven't started to use the drone in New York City yet. Uh, I have a good lens. Um, I have made friends with a lot of people who work on the water. Um, but, but in a lot of cases, um, with my good lens, whether I'm sitting at a number of locations that, uh, you know, a lot of them are parks um, around the harbor, um, I ride the Staten Island Ferry, or yesterday, yesterday I rode the New York Ferry out um, on the Sound View route from Wall Street. So the, there are a lot of opportunities to get out on the water. Um, I started taking photos in, in New York soon after I moved here. Uh, I wanted to learn more about the water, so I, I started volunteering at South Street Seaport working on one of the schooners as a deckhand. And you know, they train you, um, you're paid with uh, whatever you learn. That's, that's compensation that I wanted. Uh, but a schooner moves kind of slowly around the harbor. So I started carrying a camera. And at a certain point, the question was, you've got 2000 photos of you know, tugboats in New York Harbor, what are you gonna do with them? So I started a blog and the blog that was 2006, and the blog was instrumental, really, in my getting a job with uh, a Professional Mariner magazine as a freelance writer. And then uh, that was parlayed into getting the job now, no longer, but the job as uh, 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 onboard lecturer on the Blount Small Ships uh, boats. So it's, it's basically... Um, you know, have a good lens, pay attention to what you're taking pictures of. If you are curious, go online. There's a lot of, um, a lot of resources online to help you understand um, what you want to understand. And you could, you could become a nerd if you want. <laughs> That's great. So I just put the uh, link to your, um, uh, uh, to your blog, Tugster, uh, into the chat there. Um, we do have some questions here. So Shani, I see that you have your hand raised. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, hi, um, I wrote that I read the book 90% of Everything, which was fantastic, was all about the shipping industry and that piqued my curiosity. So I really enjoyed this lecture. I do have three questions. One was what, if the pilot boat guides ships in, why are there only two of them? Why aren't there 200 of them? How did two boats, you know, the pilot help everybody come in. That's one. The other one, I didn't catch what you said about boom boats, what that is. And number three, what was the K boat? I don't know what K was and what it was the purpose for to cover everything inside. So those are the three questions, the pilot boats, the boom boat and the K ship. Okay, the K, the K boat, I can't remember what what, uh, how it I was mentioned It hermetically that. sealed boat with a big K on it. Oh, okay, sure. sure. So, so that's a row row. Uh, roll on, roll off. Okay. Um, it has a huge tailgate. If you think of that. Think of it that way. Um, it can have up to seven thousand automobiles, or a slightly fewer number of trucks, slightly fewer number of uh, construction equipment. So a lot of uh, Caterpillar, for example, equipment gets shipped out of the United States overseas uh, via a Roro. The the you know the tracked vehicle would crawl up the uh, the tailgate and into 
the, the hold and then really secured. You might remember um, the word or the, the name of the ship, Golden Ray. It was one of those row rows that capsized while leaving Brunswick, Georgia, I think about three years ago. No, no loss of life, but the 5,500 cars that were on it, newly built in the south of the United States, uh, were all a total ruin. Boom boats. I left that, um, that, that, that word on my slide, but I had in the interest of shortening this talk, I took that photo out. But what a boom boat is, when a tanker is uh, moving cargo, um, liquid cargo in port, it needs to be surrounded by a boom. It's a, an absorbent material that's uh, floated around the ship. Uh, so that in the case that there's even a cup of oil spilled, it gets uh, absorbed by the boom. That's, that's what a boom boat, yeah. Uh, your first question, uh, and I don't know if it was a question, 95% uh, 90, of everything or 90% of everything. I read that book yep. uh, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, but I have a friend who works on ships and had a, a critique, he said, it would have been more interesting for uh, mariners if she had spent more time uh, talking to the captain and talking to the crew. So that's maybe um, that's maybe a niche for for somebody's book who's interested in uh, replicating what she did. I have that on my bookshelf here someplace. Well, the other question was the pilot boats. Why are there only two? Oh, pilot boats. Oh, okay, right. So, so, so and and I should have made this clear. That large ship that had number one on it, number two on it, those are the mother ships. So the mother ships stay out uh, at the 16 mile point at the opening to the Ambrose Channel for long periods of time, maybe a month at a time. And the pilots um, sleep there, eat there, but then to get from the mother ship onto a container ship coming into port, for example, um, and I didn't show a picture of the smaller, smaller, I mean, 50 foot, 60 foot fast boats that go alongside the, um, the container ship. And then the pilot has to literally climb up the ladder in order to uh, get onto the ship. Similarly, when a container ship is, or, or a tanker or a bulk carrier is leaving port, the pilot stays on the ship out to the mother ship and then has to climb down the ladder uh, and is retrieved by one of the smaller 50 to 60 foot pilot boats. So, so I hope so that clarifies. They have to go, get on the incoming boat to guide them and then they get off when they're guided where they're supposed to go and then they get onto one of the little boats to go back. Yes, yeah. and it doesn't matter if it's uh, summertime, 90 degrees or wintertime, 10 degrees and um, you know, 30 mile power wind blowing, so. So those little boats hang around the mothership so that they could go back and forth? And then there yes. has to be more than one, one captain, one, one person to go on to each of these ships as they come. You must have a whole crew there then doing that, don't yes. you? Yes, and, and uh, for, for some reason, the number 70 uh, comes to mind. There, there are 70 pilots. Yeah, that have would a make sense. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. of ships coming and going. Oh, sure. I couldn't yeah, understand how you have just two boats to do that. <laughs> those are the motherships. I got it. Okay. That's a good and interesting thing. Thank you very much. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks, Shani. So Janet, I see you waving your hand. I'll get to you in just a second. There was another question that was in the chat from earlier. Um, and Stephen, I see your hand raised too. Uh, so this is from AJ. Uh, these massive container vessels seem awfully top heavy. Where is the center of gravity when it's loaded? And what happens in a major storm at sea to keep the ship from rolling over? Okay, that's, that's a good question. Um, but containerization has been uh, used around the world since the, it began actually in, in, I believe, 1956. There's a great book, by the way, called The Box by Levinson, all about the, the, the evolution of container ships. What you don't see is that those container ships draw, which means under the water, part of them might be 40 to 45 feet 
So obviously you can only see what's on the surface, but uh, they're carefully loaded. Uh, the huge engine is well below the water line. And so the, 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 the center of gravity is low enough so that capsizing hasn't really been the problem. What, what has happened to some container ships is that they've split in half. Doesn't happen very often, but there was an MOL uh, container ship that I wanna say eight to 10 years ago, split in half between the Arabian Peninsula and India. And you could find a video of that online. Uh, if you go to YouTube and type, uh, I think MOL, that's the shipping line, MOL um, container ship splits in half, you can probably find it. So I hope I answered your question. I think so, yeah. So um, uh, Janet, let me, uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. There you go. Even it has nothing to do with New York City Harbor, what about that big container ship that was stuck in the Suez Canal? Can you okay. tell us anything about that? So, so, so here's something to put that into perspective. If I remember right, uh, that was called Ever Given. That was and the Ever largest Given, container ship made. Uh, no, that you know, superlatives are dangerous because okay. every time you have the biggest, the oldest, the best, the, it's going to be superseded, and so there are bigger ones now. So Ever Given had the capacity of 23,000 TEU. Oh, Keep that in mind uh, in, 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 in relation to what I said about uh, the CMA CGM Jules Verne, the largest to have come into New York City, 16,000. So on the oceans around the world, there are container ships that are much larger than the ones that come into New York. They can't come into New York because the channels are not deep enough and the bridges now are not high enough. Um, so the, the other, my, my other reaction to Ever Given is to call attention to the um, essential nature of the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal. A single ship blocked that, um, that, that, that waterway. And all of a sudden, a week later, I think they were free in, in a week, but a, a week later, they were saying that 20%, I can't remember the, the, the number exactly, but a large fraction of the world's cargo was disrupted. That's right. It was all backed up uh, on the uh, Mediterranean and so on for miles and sure. miles and miles. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if, if you're inclined to, to look at gadgets, uh, uh, go to the website marinetraffic.com and you can see the kind of traffic in different places around the world. You, you, if you want to see what the traffic north and south of the Suez Canal right now today is, you just you know go to your device and type in um, marinetraffic.com, get the app, and uh, you will soon be a nerd like me. Uh, it's really interesting to look at the traffic around places like Rotterdam and Shanghai and Singapore. Uh, if you think New York is busy, Singapore is, you know, makes New York seem like a backwater. So I hope that responds to your questions. Yeah, thanks, Will. Uh, Steve, uh, Stephen Duncan, I see you have your hand raised. You can unmute. Yes. Uh, first of all, I, I, uh, Jeff, uh, thank you very much for bringing this guest. This was a great presentation, a real eye opener to uh, to us all. It opened up like a whole a whole uh, world for us. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my qu my question to the presenter is this: uh, Will um, I noticed like some of the names I found fascinating on some of the some of the uh, ships and boats and stuff. Like for example, on the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, one of the U.S. Co Coast Guard boats, Cat uh, Catherine War. Walker. And another boat, there was a Ridley Thomas. Some of these names are fascinating on these boats. What, what, where do these names come from? Or who are these people? Or uh, what can you tell us about names that are on these ships and boats? They're, they're pretty, very interesting. 
Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and if if I looked up Ridley Thomas, uh, I've, I've forgotten. I, I probably knew at one point. But Catherine Walker is an interesting one. Catherine Walker was initially the wife of a lighthouse keeper uh, in a lighthouse in New York Harbor. It's, it's the small lighthouse between Bayonne, New Jersey and Staten Island, uh, St. George area. The lighthouse is still there. It's still an aid to navigation. Catherine Walker's husband died. She petitioned to become the replacement lighthouse keeper and she did. And I was just now looking at a bio of her. Uh, Catherine Walker was the lighthouse keeper at um, Robin's Reef. That's the name of the lighthouse, Robin's Reef. Robin is the Dutch word for seal, by the way. Um, so Robin's Reef Lighthouse, Catherine Walker was the lighthouse keeper there for like 40 years. She's responsible for saving 100 people. So when a certain class of uh, Coast Guard vessel came out, they decided to honor, um, it's called the keeper class. And I believe all of the uh, boats of that Coast Guard class are named for female keepers. Uh, f f female lighthouse keepers. Uh, some of the names are really crazy. Um, so for example, there was a bulk carrier in port a couple weeks ago called Mega Maggie. Mega Maggie. <laughs> um, my my all-time favorite, um, oh, oh, there was one called Pretty Things. Uh, it was, it, it, it transported scrap metals. Um, Surfer Rosa. Um, I, actually, if, if you go to the blog, if I can be shamelessly self-promoting here, if you go to the blog, tuxter.wordpress.com, um, and type in, there's a search window, you type in names, N-A-M-E-S, names, and I've got like 40 posts uh, profiling weird names of ships. So, uh, but, but, so th there was one that came in recently. It was uh, sister to the Jules Verne. And it was the CMA CGM von Humboldt. And von Humboldt was a quite famous oceanographer who, who, who plotted uh, ocean currents. So, you know, the names are significant. They're, they're, they're handy labels, but, but, you know, you can learn you could learn a lot just by Googling every ship's name that you think might have some fascinating background. Thank you. Yeah, um, and HA, I see you have your uh, hand raised. You can unmute yourself. Hi, I um, was just curious that um, sometimes when I'm on Long Beach and I'm sitting on the beach during the summer, I see in the distance these huge ships, and I'm wondering, would that marine traffic app tell me which ships are out there? Absolutely, yes, and that would be that would be the way to proceed. There, there is an anchorage there, um, and and because in recent uh, week couple weeks, COVID has has hit port workers in Port Elizabeth and Port Newark. Uh, there's been a second anchorage, anchorage that has started up off of Point Pleasant, and I've never seen ships there before. And now, don't misunderstand me. We don't have a backup in New York like Long Beach, LA does, or like Savannah does. But there has been a mini backup uh, in those two anchorages uh, because of COVID. So yes, get get the app. Uh, you'll have a lot of fun. Yeah, I, thank I, you. I always, uh, when I'm sitting on the beach looking out, I always uh, try to imagine what the people are doing on the ship and what life is like out there on the sea and how many people are on those ships. And I just uh, use my imagination <laughs> and make my own stories up. Well, uh, th th those are those are interesting. Um... You know, there's there's a hidden workforce, whether it's the people who collect my garbage at uh, three o'clock in the morning or the people who 
who are crew on ships um, bringing this laptop from wherever it was manufactured to the Apple store so I could buy it. Now, one of the things you might be interested to know is that um, about 25% of mariners, seagoing mariners globally are from the Philippines. And they might be on the ship for eight, nine months at a time and then have a month off or three months off or something like that. Um, if, if you want another tool besides the app, buy a VHF radio. VHF radio is what ships use to communicate with and listen to the accents of the people communicating, in, in many cases uh, in the anchorage, communicating with uh, the Coast Guard or communicating with some of the uh, port services boats. Because many of them have, um, you know, ac Filipino accents, Indian accents, uh, Russian accents, Ukrainian accents, um, Chinese accents, and so on. So, uh, yeah. It's, so it's, those it's, those chips that are out there, when I see them from the beach, there, they're docked because it doesn't look to me like they're moving. No, they're anchored. They're anchored. They are. I mean, anchored. Yes. Yeah, and 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 in some cases, um, they've already been to been to uh, the port. They've discharged cargo. In the case of, let's say, a bulk carrier or a tanker, they've they've discharged a cargo, and now they're waiting waiting for orders. So they they're waiting there because um, they don't know where they're going. They're waiting for a dispatcher who may be in Europe, he may be in Asia, he may be in South America, saying, okay, uh, looks like we've located a cargo for you in Brazil. And, but they don't wanna head you know, east across the ocean before they have a destination. That would be wasting fuel. So a lot of them are, are waiting for orders. Interesting, thank you. Thank you. And I, I definitely recommend the app. It's, it's quite a lot of fun. I actually uh, was introduced to it um, when uh, my, my daughter is a biologist studying whales and she was off on a tagging ship for about two weeks. So she shared this app with us, this website, and uh, we were able to keep track of where she was off the coast of Massachusetts. And it, it's a lot of fun just to keep track of all the colorful uh, moving pieces. Um, yeah. See, so I, uh, Bob, I just want to check in. Do you have any questions that came to you in the chat? Yes, I do, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> one question. I have one question, and it is: uh, Do these cargo ships carry passengers like the fiftieth or the nineteen sixtieth? Some do, and um, it, it's always been a uh, you know on my short list uh, to board, a, board a, a cargo ship in Port Elizabeth, uh, New Jersey, for example, and take it over uh, to, you know, whatever destination. Years ago, I was looking at what, what I thought was going to be a dream trip. It was going to be from Port Elizabeth down to Dar es Salaam. So across the Atlantic, across the Mediterranean, through the Suez, down the east coast of Africa, and then back to Europe. It was, uh, you know, like... 75 days or something. Uh, food is quite good. For, for my um, writing career, I, I sometimes ride along on, um, mostly on tugboats. And some of, the, some of the food is excellent because you, know, you need some sort of motivation um, when there's no other stimulation, whether it's you know, being able to call, call up a friend or walk around the corner and visit a friend or have a beer or something like that. So compensation is not only the money, but also good food. But yes, there are um, cargo ships that take passengers. Just Google it. Great. Uh, Bob, were there any other questions uh, on the, the chat on your end? Uh, not yet, Jeff. Okay. So Shani, I see you have your uh, hand raised again. You can- uh, Yeah, I just wanted to say to HA, 
that the book that I had read, 90% of everything really described life on the container ships. And it also said that they stay sometimes for years and sometimes they don't get paid and they have a lot of problems there. So it described a lot of the problems. These people are waiting, hanging out for another job. And meanwhile, they're not getting paid and they're very generally poor people too. So, but it was very yeah. interesting about the container ship. And they could be gone for years at a time. It was a very hard life that they lived. But she might like reading about that. Was, I learned a lot from that book. That's why I was so interested today. <laughs> really true. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, H.A., I see you have your hand raised again. I just wanted to ask you, do you ever hear from these, uh, you know, cargo ships and stuff that are out there? Is there um, a very small percentage of these pirates that, uh, you know, that they worry about? Um, you know, I, I, I could very easily have thrown in another 200 photos. Um, occasionally, and I've, I've posted these on the blog, occasionally you, you can see still deployed around the side of the vessel, uh, either uh, chain link fencing or these pieces of plastic that would prevent a pirate from you know, flinging a grappling hook over the rail of a, of a ship. So um, I've, I've not heard, you know, firsthand from these people, but I've read articles, um, you know, the, the, the area around Yemen and Somalia, as well as uh, the Gulf of Guinea on the uh, south of the west coast of Africa and places around Sing uh, Singapore, you know, there's a place there called the Malacca Straits, where there are a lot of ships in close proximity, a lot of them anchored. And uh, piracy is, is, is an issue. Uh, just reading the, you know, the, a good newspaper, you would be able to search and, and find stories about that. So piracy is an issue. Yeah. Um, well, I think you may have inspired a, a whole new uh, slew of um, Boating and shipping nerds today, Will. So I, um, <laughs> I appreciate all of this. Yes, um, and, and obviously a lot more that we can um, uh, dig into and research. I put your um, blog uh, link into the chat and marinetraffic.com into the chat there. 